So welcome, and tonight we are covering um, an important topic, especially in the world that we live in today, but actually in the world that we've been living in for the last few thousand years. And the question of how we look after the sexual health um, and also the sexual intelligence of our teenagers has actually been a question that's been around for a very long time. And I'm hoping I can add some aspects to the conversation this evening. So the first question, of course, is, is who am I and why am I talking about this tonight? So just to introduce myself to those of you that don't know me, I'm a family physician and consultant specialist at CMH Hospital, which is a large regional hospital here in Hamtansani. Um, I'm just going to start my video. That might make it a little bit easier as I'm an expansive speaker. There we go. Um, so there we go. Great. So I'm locally, I'm sitting here in Tinsa, which is where from my home, which is where we are doing this um, lecture from. It's a little rural village just outside East London. And I've got lots of very many hats and all of these hats sort of come together in what I'm going to be talking about tonight. So I'm the convener for the Diploma of HIV Management. It's a diploma for district doctors who want to uh, be confident in managing HIV out in our rural areas, as well as in our large hospitals. Um, and I've been interested for many years in terms of the implementation of HIV guidelines and teaching specifically on HIV. I'm also on the execo quite recently of the South African Sexual Health Association, and I'm going to be specifically looking at some of the Eastern Cape aspects of that. Um, and for many years, for more than a decade now, I've been serving on the Rural Doctors Association of South Africa, EXCO, where I'm specifically carrying the mentoring portfolio. So mentoring, teaching, training um, on levels of doctors, community, parents, and that's very much part of, of what I do. Uh, my interest first started back in 2003 when we were living in the UK at that stage for a stint um, where I trained and worked as a school doctor and I've been involved in sort of school doctor aspects in South Africa since our return in 2006 um, and in the last term or so I've been doing a lecture tour at various schools all over South Africa as well as Lillyfontaine School here in East London looking specifically at the issue of sexual health. My day-to-day -day job is actually providing family medicine care at our outpatients um, at CMH, and that includes adolescents, and we have an HIV clinic where we're also specifically interested in adolescent care. So you can see I'm coming very much from a public health perspective, and um, it's all about how do we improve sexual health outcomes. So we look very much at data, and with data, we try and figure out how to, how to manage our patients. So here is some of the, the data that um, is informing some of our decisions. So for example, here you can see, this is from our Stats SA data from 2020. And these were surveys that they did specifically in people between the ages of 15 and 34. Um, and they asked the question, at which age did you have your sexual debut? We also call it the COITAG, if you want posh medical language. And you can see there's, um, although the most of the distribution, most people will have their first sort of sexual activity between the ages of 16 and 20 years. Um, in South Africa, girls, 16% of girls under 16 um, and 27% of boys. And you can see in the Eastern Cape there, that's a bit higher. So 20% of 7% of girls having their first um, sexual experience before the age of 16 and 34% of our boys. Um, and there is a percentage of people also that by the age of 34 is not, not necessarily even had sex. But you can certainly see for us as parents, when we look at our teenagers, um, we know that sex is imminent, so to speak. Then we, from a public health point of view, we become very interested in things like pregnancy, HIV, STIs. And then we look at sexual health behavior. So we look at condoms and we look at number of partners um, and the stats are specifically looking the way we look um, or the way we measure condom use is when we do surveys is we ask people at the last time that you had sex, did you use a condom? So it's sort of a way to create a standard indicator for condom use. And you can see here um, in that particular survey, only 59% of women had used condoms at the last sexual intercourse um, and 68% of men, and that's even slightly lower in the Eastern Cape. Um, these mean number of sexual partners, remember the group was between the ages of 15 and 34, um, and you can see more 
number of sexual partners in the men um, than the women. But we certainly no longer live in an era where we expect most people will only have one partner for life. And then, of course, one of the major issues in South Africa is specifically around teenage pregnancies. So this is our 2020 stats. Um, and if you look at all the live births that we had in 2020, there were 499 teenagers under the age of 13, between 10 and 13, who fell pregnant. Um, and if you look under 17 years, 3.7% of all births, so a good 34,000 um, kids under 17, 17 years and younger fell pregnant in 2020. So these are the, the kinds of numbers that gets everybody terrified, right? As parents, we all um, look at our children growing up and developing and we want to keep them safe. Um, and this is a bit, this is what this talk is all about. How do we help to keep our kids safe? How do we help to reach these common goals? And when you look at sexual health goals, I'd find there nobody ever disagrees. We all have exactly the same goals when we talk about sex. We want our kids to have sex as late as possible, when they're ready, when they're prepared, when they're able to manage the dynamics of sex. We want to avoid unplanned pregnancies. Um, we want to avoid STIs. And we want our kids to have happy and fulfilling sexual relationships. And within that meaning, relationships that are safe in which they are not getting harmed in some way. The debate is more on how do we reach these sexual health goals? So how do we manage to achieve that? Um, and I think we're all aware that there are the, the kinds of things we want to try and bring in is either extrinsic controls. So those are sort of rules that we bring in. We're going to talk quite a bit about that um, versus intrinsic controls. So how do we help our children to themselves better negotiate some of, some of these issues. So extrinsic goals, that we know those, they've been around for decades. And what I want to focus on today is exploring some of these intrinsic controls. How do we foster the kind of sexual intelligence we need to help keep our kids safe? Um, and we're gonna explore specifically the neuroscience of behavior and the neuroscience of control to help better prepare us. So this lecture is, it's going to be a bit medical, I do apologize, um, because what we've learned in the world of HIV, what I've learned in the world of diabetes um, and the world of pretty much education um, of our patients is that the best we can do is give you the newest and latest information we have um, around, for example, the neuroscience of behavior. Um, and then you, as in your particular households, you will decide how you're going to best use that information. What I'm not going to do today, and this is a reassurance, is I'm not planning to try and dictate different parenting methods or different parenting um, styles, as they call it, or advocate any specific uh, values or rules or regulations of how you should be a parent and what you should do as a parent. What I'm going to give is you give you some house useful tips on a little bit, some of the ways that you're already working in your family, how you can maximize that to help improve the sexual intelligence and emotional intelligence of, of your children. So the first part, and this is what we're going to do until the break, is we're going to really delve into understanding the neuroscience of emotional intelligence and to some extent sexual intelligence. And we're going to start a little bit one step back and being understand on why teenagers and maybe sometimes even us as parents can be such a pain in the ass. So for this, we need to delve a little bit into our own physiology. And something that we know very well in medicine, and actually everybody's sort of aware of this on a, on a basic neuroscience um, level, is that we have these different physiological modes that are very much dependent on the kinds of hormones or endocrines, endocrinology that's going on in your body. The one mode I'm going to use the word survival mode. And when we speak about survival mode in the world of medicine, we're quite often referring to the sympathetic nervous system. And in this picture of the brain down here, you can see in the middle there, right above the brain stem, there is what we call the limbic brain, but it's actually part um, of a whole set of different parts of the brain that can also be called the stress axis. It's got the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the adrenal gland um, axis in that. But it's part to do, it's the part of our brains that's the oldest. It can, it's, part, it's the oldest part of our evolution. And its primary goal is to keep us safe. The other part I'm going to call the creative mode. 
And the creative mode, when we're on creative mode, the limbic brain is quiet. And we are now primarily leading from the prefrontal cortex. So that's a part of our evolution that came much, much later um, and is still busy developing in our, in our current society. And in medicine, we often call this the parasympathetic nervous system is now predominant. Um, and these two different modes literally gives us different physiological changes. Now, this we often explain to our patients when we're talking about anxiety and stress, for example. So when you're on survival mode, you will have more adrenaline in your system. And during that time, your body was physiologically changed. So literally your blood pressure will go up, your heart rate will go up, your muscles will go tense, the blood will go away from your tummy and you might get that fluttery feeling. Um, you have sweat pouring off your forehead, your hands might start tingling. And those are physiological changes that is taking place um, as part of that survival mode. In creative mode, the blood pressure comes back down, the breathing comes back down, you're now able to digest your food. Um, and we have these very different physiological experiences. This we all know. What we all forget is that during these two times, the brain also changes dramatically. So if I was to take an MRI, one of these um, active MRIs of your brain, of the blood circulation in your brain during these two modes, you will notice that in survival mode, most of the circulation is going to be around that stress axis. That's where everything is happening. And the larger part of the cerebral cortex, as well as the prefrontal cortex, large parts of that is literally going quiet. They are slower, harder work, um, and the brain's going to go for quick, quick survival mechanisms. When you're on creative mode, you suddenly have access to the whole brain, including your limbic brain, but now you have access to this prefrontal cortex and all the abilities within it. Important to remember is there's a switch. So there's a switch that switches you between survival mode and creative mode. And sometimes you can sit somewhere in the middle, but we tend to go, and the, that, that switch is controlled by adrenaline and it's controlled by how safe we feel. So, as human beings, we are geared towards safety on different levels. We need to feel physically safe. If you're on the N2 and the taxi drive turns in in front of you and you have to slam on the brakes, you'll have a moment of feeling that survival mode kicking in. We all need to feel emotionally safe. We need to feel like we are loved, that we are cared for, that we are part of a family and a troop. And we all need to feel safe to be who we are, to choose what profession we want to follow, to feel safe to express um, our personalities, our genders, our race, etc. So all of this is part of our daily living. And every single human being has these two modes. I'm now going to dive a little bit into these, and they're all based very much on some amazing writers, and I make no apologies for using their extraordinary analogies. Um, and the first, we're going to focus a little bit on what the survival mode looks like, so particularly on how it affects our thinking. So when we look at survival mode and we look at the survival brain, um, I often like to call this street view. So you know those video games where you're down in the streets, you're busy fighting the baddies, there's some... Um, Dangers might be just ahead and you just got to keep out. When's the bad guys going to come? Where are the weapons I need to pick up that I might need? And you're thinking very much in that survival um, strategy. And that's what that brain has been, been designed for. In street view, we are basically uh, subject to the instincts and the drives that lives within this limbic symptom. So the instincts is telling us about the stuff we need to run away from. So the things that might put us at risk. So that's our fight, flight, free system. But we also have drives that has to do with a perpetuation of the species and keeping us safe as a species. And so we have some very basic drives that form part of the living system. Drives for food. We all know what that's like. Drives to feel secure drives for power because that's what we keeps us and our troop safe, um, our troop, our family, who belongs to us, our territory, and of course the drive for sex. So these are very um, uh, evolutionarily been with us since forever and they part of, they wired into each and every human being. And you can see in the world that we live on, live in, especially if you're looking currently what's happening in Europe and the Ukraine and you're wondering where Putin is sitting at the moment in terms of how they're looking at the word world, they are looking at the world through the street view perspective. Um, and what is important for them is power, my troop territory, um, and those kinds of, of things that belongs to our survival brain. What happens when you're in this mode though, when you're in street view is it changes your thinking. And here I'm gonna draw on the amazing work of a man called Daniel Kahneman, 
Um, he's actually got a Nobel Prize in economics, but he's a behavioral scientist. Um, and he specifically looked at, he wrote this book called Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, and looking at the different ways of thinking that we have. So when we are in survival brain mode, we use fast thinking because we have to think ourselves in and out of dangerous, potentially dangerous situations. And this kind of thinking is um, emotional thinking. It's very much linked to our endocrine system, linked to our fight, flight, and freeze. And because we have to make assumptions quickly, we get some shortcuts that we take. So we make very quick assumptions about scenarios. We jump to conclusions. So if you're walking down a path, it's a rustle in the grass, oh, might be a snake, jump out of the way. Um, and about 80% of the times, we actually quite correct in some of our assumptions, but a lot of the times we're also wrong. So Kahneman's book looks at bias. If you ever wonder all of those lovely biases that we have, where they come from, they come from that fast thinking, making quick decisions about things. When we talk about the development of teenagers, which we'll do in a minute, you will see that teenagers lives very strongly within this survival brain thinking. So if you wonder what survival brain thinking look like, just look at your teenagers. So this thinking is also unstable, it's inconsistent because it is this shortcut methodology and it's very black and white. So when you're busy um, making quick decisions in terms of your physical survival, you don't have time to consider every detail. You go, you're gonna have to go with what are things gonna work? What do I think is not gonna work? What is good and what is bad? And we can see that very strongly with our teenagers. When they look at the world, there's this very black and white division of, of how things work. This kind of thinking is very powerful. It's our go-to thinking because it's so quick, but it's not our most intelligent part of our thinking. And if you want to really explore the content of fast thinking, you go and spend some time on social media. So Facebook is a lovely example um, of that off the top of our head, things that we think about the world um, and all the opinions that we hold so dear and feel so strongly about and are so convinced are so absolutely correct. So the behavior that uh, we have when we are in street view and using this fast thinking, um, I'm going to use the analogy from Prof. Steve Peters. He actually calls it the chimp. When I work with adolescents, I quite often like calling it the dragon, but sexier than a chimp. Um, but we have this inner chimp and you can imagine how we behave when we are in this limbic brain thinking. And there's a purpose. So the purpose of the chimp is about managing that threat, whatever that may be. And sometimes we can't manage that threat. We can't actually get away from the thing that might be making us feel unsafe. And then if it can't manage the threat, it's going to try and reduce our anxiety. We don't like feeling anxious. It's a horrible feeling. So when we are in chimp mode, so to speak, we're living very much in the present and we either get drawn towards things that might or may not be so good for us. So it's directly linked to our dopamine reward system. It's all about fun and entertainment. So it's when you talk about the entertainment industry, you're talking about entertaining the chimp and the marketing industry knows the chimp very, very well. Um, but also when you're in that mode, you're quite self-focused. So you're not really able to step into somebody else's shoes when you are in this mode because you have to think about survival. If you're getting mugged, for example, you can't go and think, oh, shame, you know, he's poor and he's struggling. You know, I should be grateful that I have something that I can give him. When you're on that mode, you are only going to worry about your own safety in that moment. It's an interesting dynamic because it's both proud and insecure at the same time. Our teenagers are a beautiful example of that. And remember, because it's all about threat, it has a negative bias when it looks at the world. So it's got a slightly paranoid, vigilant look and is looking for danger and is looking for the slight and is looking for the safety. So we often hear the world is snowflake, the snowflake uh, generation at the moment. And snowflake children are children that are slightly higher levels um, of, of anxiety in some ways, and they find themselves a little bit sensitive to the world. So they're slightly more paranoid and vigilant about what's happening in the world. And I think one of the big qualities that we feel so strongly in our social media is the extraordinary emotive judgment that comes when we are in chimp or dragon mode. And our teenagers are experts at emotive judgment. And it is so um, unbudging and so uh, un unforgiving sometimes in when they and when one looks at the world. So this mode is not a mode that we get rid of. It's not a mode that's even a bad mode. It's just part of who we are. But if it's not um, in its place, if it takes over, if that is the only mode that you are functioning here, this is where it can become aggressive and dangerous. 
So whenever we see things happening in the world where you are shocked at what people do to other people in terms of inflicting pain or suffering, then you can be sure that this is the mode that is taking charge at that time. Great, so now we have a little bit of a, a world of, of teenage world. And now let's look at where we want to get to. So the creative brain is very different later in our evolution and has a different purpose. The purpose of our creative brains is self-fulfillment and meaning, finding meaning and purpose. Um, and it's quite interesting because actually meaning and purpose is not nor normally compatible with survival mode. They're sometimes completely different. Uh, and I love to, like we have that street view, I like the picture of now we have a balcony view. So if you're in street view, fighting baddies down there, when you're in balcony view, you can out, look out over the town, you can see what's coming and you can see what's gone before. So when we're in balcony view, the prefrontal cortex now takes charge. Your limbic system is still there, but it's now subject to the prefrontal cortex. And now we have new qualities that come out that's very different than chimp mode. We're now able to be clear and to be able to be honest. So honesty, not always a good policy when you're in survival mode. But here we now have a conscience. We can be law binding. We're able to have self-control. We're able to delay gratification for the greater good, um, to say no to that cookie right now go to the gym, sit down and study for our matric exams. Um, and this is where we're able to be tolerant and flexible when we're looking out on a scenario. Daniel Kahneman calls this slow thinking. And you can imagine you, you have to use this kind of thinking or you have access to this kind of thinking when you're in creative brain mode. So if you are doing maths, for example, in your head, so say you had to try and calculate 17 times 32 in your head, when you sit down and do that activity, you can literally feel the extra energy that your brain has to use. So this kind of thinking requires focus and attention and effort. And as a matter of fact, if you're tired, you won't even try and do it. And if you're stressed, you'll really struggle to do it because you don't actually have access to those parts of your brain. This is the part that we use to interpret information, to really go through the facts, to think something through. This is where we're able to be rational and logical um, and now we're able to see the whole context. We can see perspective. We can see all the different points of view. And you finally have this ability to see these shades of gray and the balanced judgment um, that is so missing, for example, in the Ukraine war at the moment. So this kind of thinking is slower. So that's why it's not our go-to thinking, but this is where our real intelligence lies. So when you have those amazing stories of extraordinary things that people do, and when you have those extraordinary moments in your own life, whether it's in your profession or whether it's with your children um, or whether it's in your relationship where you have a really meaningful conversation or you do something at work where you really feel, wow, there I was at my best, you can be sure that you were in creative mode and used all of these aspects of your, of your brain. So when we look at behavior, um, I like to call it the sage, that beautiful painting there is of Maria Makeba, um, or I like to think of the Jedi when we work um, with our teenagers. So with the teenagers, we've got the dragon and we've got the Jedi. Um, and the Jedi is this higher part of ourselves, this prefrontal cortex part of ourselves. And it's not directly linked to our endocrine system. It's therefore able to observe and respond to what is happening. Um, and here it is, we can have an experience actually of joy, which is also obviously mediated through our endocrine system, but there is this um, ability to have a, and be at peace with the world and be at peace with who you are and what you are achieving. When we are in this mode, this is when we're able to be empathic. Now you can step into somebody else's shoes and imagine what they're experiencing. This is where we're able to be compassionate. This is where we're able to be generous and humble this is where we're able to be most creative and are most innovative. Um, and this is a statement from Jen Jen Brene Brown, uh, which I love, where she talks about being generous in our assumptions. Imagine what social media would be like, or imagine what our teenagers' lives would be like if people were more generous in their assumptions um, before they comment on somebody's status or somebody's um, opinion. So these are extraordinary qualities is... Um, what we quite often bring to our children. And I think because we love our children so much, quite often we are able to draw on this part of ourselves. It takes sometimes effort. Um, it takes extra energy. Um, but if we love somebody, this, this is the parts of ourselves that, that comes to the fore. And so this is where we are at our most healing and at our most loving when we're in prefrontal cortex mode.
So sometimes we like to classify the world into bad people and good people, but there's no bad people and good people. There are people who are in chimp mode and there are people who are in creative mode or Jedi mode. Um, and we all have therefore the ability to have moments where we are extraordinary in what we do in the world and moments where we cause pain and suffering. So I want to bring another quote. I'm going to just delve, delve another layer down. Um, there's actually a presentation. I will, when I send around the final recording of everything, I will send links to a presentations that I do that takes all of this and goes into a lot of detail and specifically also how you work with these concepts in relationships. Now I'm just going to touch on some of these because we're going to come back to those when we talk about how we create sexual intelligence. And I want to mention the saboteurs because they are so key. So this is from um, Cesar Chamin. He's an extraordinary psychologist who's written a book called Positive Intelligence and does a lot of research around how we work to access this prefrontal cortex in our daily activities. And he describes mechanisms that our chimp mode uses to reduce anxiety. So remember I said, when you're in chimp mode, you either try and manage a threat, you're trying to survive, but you don't like that experience of anxiety. So you're trying to find ways to feel less anxious. And these mechanisms we create in childhood, actually when we're quite little, by about 11 or 12, most of your children will already have created these mechanisms that they use to reduce anxiety. And they're quite complex patterns that reduce stress. And they've actually been, uh, we've been wired to create these patterns because they're useful in physical threats. So say you have a child who grows up in a household where you've got quite an aggressive father, for example, or somebody who um, is an alcoholic and he comes home and he is being vicious and dangerous and the child learns to run upstairs and go and hide under the bed. So that's a useful avoidance strategy at that time. But say now he grows up and him and his wife is having an argument about something that they need to sort out in their relationship. If he runs and goes and hides under the bed, that's not going to be very useful. So we find some of these mechanisms that feels would be quite useful in a physical threat situation is not very useful in complex situations that needs innovation and creation and empathy and being able to see somebody else's point of view. So they're really bad in, in relationships. And yet we come to the fore, they come to the fore quite often when we're in chimp mode to try and reduce anxiety. The first principle, the first thing we need to start becoming aware of is whenever people are behaving badly, and here I want you to think of your adolescence, there is probably a saboteur in play. And being able to recognize that, being able to say, my child right now is in chimp mode or dragon mode, depending on how <clears throat> frightening they are. Um, and this is because they are trying to reduce their anxiety. That's why they're behaving that badly. That already gives you a little bit of possibility of not taking it quite so personally. So let's look at them. They're so fun. fun. So this is a, a, a quite a big complicated table here. If you want to go and really explore these um, Shazar Tamin's website has even got like a, an online questionnaire you can do to discover your own saboteurs. We, I think we use all of them at some point. But we all have our favorites. And you will see here we've got a fight, freeze, flee possibilities. Um, some people tend to fight more when they get stressed. Some people will use ways of trying to earn and negotiate. Some people will try and avoid. But these are all mechanisms we are using to make us feel less anxious. And quite often they can make a scenario worse, which is why we're calling them saboteurs. So I want to take an example that it's 10 o'clock at night and your kid was supposed to be big act back at 10 o'clock. That was the curfew that was set and 10 o'clock and your child has not yet walked through the door. And when you're sending those messages on WhatsApp, the phone is off or out of reach. So you can't get hold of them. And now they are your anxiety levels are busy starting to go through the roof. And we have a lot of automatic things that happens in this time. So please, this is not about bad or good. This is about observing how you behave when your anxiety levels go up. So what happens to you when you're in chimp mode? So one of the, the most common one is we criticize, right? So the criticism is not necessarily logical always, but we need to criticize. So if your husband is home or your wife is home, you might turn to your partner and give them hell for not having either set the boundary or this is because you did this last time or, um, or you might sit there criticizing yourself or in your head, you might already be criticizing your child or you might be criticizing the school or you might be criticizing the friend. Um, and doing that activity, criticizing makes us feel momentarily as if we're actually doing something. Something. 
We might try and manipulate the, organ, the situation. Um, so it's not a bad thing to sometimes have to step in, but calling the police at five past 10 might not be the most appropriate um, action. It's a Friday night. They're not interested that your child is five minutes late. Um, or we can try and overanalyze and become over analytical about what's thinking and what, what's going on and trying to overanalyze ourselves and trying to overanalyze our partner and trying to overanalyze our child. We can start cleaning the kitchen and sorting out all the shelves. We can decide, um, be, we can try and give complete benefit of doubt and completely believe that it's all fine. Not, you know, the child does walk in late and not say a thing because we don't want to cause any conflict. So pleasing is a way of also dealing with stress. Worrying, oh God, we all do that. Uh, every possible scenario goes in your head of everything that could possibly have gone wrong about why your child is not here. And then those that like to avoid might go to bed and just not think about it, gonna ignore it, gonna pretend it hasn't happened sitting at the kitchen table, oh, oh, oh why me? Um, I want to go to bed, my child's not here. And then of course, distracting. So either going on the Netflix binge or getting a bottle of whiskey or smoking cigarettes. Um, and all of these are mechanisms that we use in a wide range of society, a wide range of scenarios. And the reason why they exist is to make us feel less anxious. That's important to remember. But the next thing that happens is quite often that whatever the scenario is, it quite often can make things worse. Because remember, you're not using your full creative, amazing prefrontal cortex. You are only thinking in that particular little, little mode. So when we think about consciousness and we talk about the prefrontal cortex and the limbic brain, our consciousness, our daily consciousness is a marriage between this dragon and this Jedi. Um, and what's important to remember is that our dragon is not something that you switch on and off. It's always on. The dragon's always there. And you, the Jedi, flying that dragon, that's my teenage one, or you can imagine you're in a car and the chimp is always driving and you are the one that is hopefully navigating the chimp. So what's supposed to happen is the dragon is actually flying and it's looking out, it's screening the environment. Is there danger? Is there something I need to think about? Is there something that's going to put us at risk? And if everything is safe, the dragon relaxes, our adrenaline levels go down. And now the Jedi is able to, you have prefrontal cortex. So if you want to do really creative or innovative things, or if you just want to stare blankly in the mirror and brush your teeth. As soon as something is unsafe, so that taxi pulls in in front of you on the highway, you get that alarm. So alarm goes off, wah, wah, wah. Uh, the dragon screeches loudly. And what's supposed to now happen is the dragon is supposed to say, look out, look out, look out. And then the Jedi is the one that's supposed to decide what's going to happen next. So ideally your prefrontal cortex, especially around complex situations, is supposed to make the decisions on what happens in our lives and is supposed to steer the dragon. For acute physical threats, the dragon's better because it's quick. You know, you, you're going to pull away from that taxi before your prefrontal cortex has even come online. But if you're going to have a conversation with your teenager, then you actually want to rather have some of that prefrontal cortex wisdom um, involved in, in that conversation. So there in the top right, I'm just a reminder, and I want you to just be aware, just waiting for my connection to pick back up. Hopefully that's back, back on. So I just want to put you back in the scenario because you all know what it's like. Um, you all have parents yourself. If your parents are still alive or you will remember when you were a child in your own household, how it feels when a parent or a caregiver or even a grandparent criticizes you, right? So their little chimps coming to the fore ignores or avoids you because they're busy or distracted or angry at you. Or if they're trying to manipulate you, you might still have parents who's trying to get you to do all kinds of things you don't necessarily want to do. Or when you're having conversations with them are always negative about everything you say or he constantly lectures you about your life. So in all of these scenarios, if you've had an experience of having a parent do that to you, you will know that in those scenarios, the first thing that happens is one of your chimp reactions come out. And so there's a general good rule that any chimp action will usually elicit an even greater chimp reaction. And I like to call these chimp wars. And all of you that have adolescents has had a good chimp war, I promise in the last week. Ours is usually about the unpacking of the dishwasher. Um, and one can get into these scenarios where one's tired, one's exhausted, you um, feeling, 
you had a day with all kinds of things going on and something goes wrong and you go straight into one of those chimp modes. It's not a bad thing. We all have those moments. But now the child feels unsafe, the child feels criticized, the child feels attack, and they come back with double volume as they do. And now you decide to react same in the same chimp mode. And suddenly you can have conversations that can actually become quite dangerous and can become quite hurtful. And any conversations where you've afterwards felt that didn't went well, that didn't go well, and that did not really get us where we needed to be to, it was probably because you were both in chimp mode when you were having that conversation. So again, a, a lot more information about how we manage chimp wars and what we do in those scenarios is in some of my other um, YouTube presentations. But we need to get on to sex because this is what it's all about. So how does this chimp um, prefrontal cortex develop in the adolescent? So that's going to become quite important in terms of how we work with adolescents. And actually, this development is a lifelong journey. It's not just something that happens in, in our teenagers, because all of us have this beautiful, powerful, quite stupid dragon that has to be steered. And we all have this amazing Jedi Knight that has this ability to control and steer the dragon and make the decisions about how we want to leave our lives. So for our development, when we grow up, we have to learn how to steer the dragon. That's the job in terms of becoming an adult. And when you look at the neurodevelopmental development of the brain, this is a process that happens over time. So quite often people will go, oh, but this bit's only mature by then, and this bit is only mature by then. But before any part of the brain matures, it does go through like an apprentice phase. So for neurons to mature and for neural networks to form, they literally have to be used. So for example, our visual cortexes are only fully myelinized by the time we're 11 or 12 years old, but we're able to see from a young age, not very well at birth, but it matures, it matures, it matures. And the more we look and see, the more the, our vision and those neural networks mature and finally myelinize. And it's similar for the limbic brain as well as the prefrontal cortex. So if we look at the chimp develop, at the chimp or the dragon development in the child, um, when the child is born, that whole limbic system is very um, immature still. It's got very basic reflexes. It's more the brainstem that's in action. But from about the age of two or three, that sort of dragon comes online. And you can imagine a little baby dragon there and it's ready and it's very good at saying, no, I will not do this. Well, yes, I would like that cookie. So it's starting to be to work out that little dragon. And that little dragon is going to get a lot of work out as it, as it grows up. By around about from about the age of eight, our endocrine system is getting activated. So as our brain and as that stress axis matures, our hypothalamus starts making all kinds of sex hormones and we start creating um, or start creating the links towards the sex hormones and we're starting to create an endocrine system. Um, and the child will now, some children can go into puberty already from about eight, nine years old, some a bit later, there's a lot of variety, but certainly the body starts to mature quite dramatically. And what's interesting with a child, by the age of 14, 15, that survival system is fully developed. So by the time the child is 14, 15 years old, the child has got a dragon that is 100% in action. Um, and the sexual organs are actually completed at this age, and we'll talk a little bit about the sexuality and how that can differ in different and different people but actually that system is already there and it's already ready um, on a certain level if we now look at the development of the prefrontal cortex and there's a lot of misunderstanding about that development um, by age of nine the prefrontal cortex comes online so your inner jedi apprentice is born by the age of nine or 10. So the child is able to start using their prefrontal cortex. Those neural networks are actually in place. They're still very basic. They're still going to have to grow and mature. But the child starts asking questions around nine and 10 about purpose and meaning and who they are. By 12 to 14, almost 70% of the prefrontal cortex is myelinized and mature. So speci specifically our thinking functions. So that's why children are able to write matric and do mathematics and a lot of things like that. Um, and a lot of their social functions are already matured by the ages of 12 to 14. And then there's another part of the brain, the executive function of the brain, that particularly is good at understanding risk and planning future. The things we know is so challenging for teenagers. Those functions are present, 
but they apprentice phase. So they will continue to mature and they will continue to myelinize and it can take up to 23, 24 those neural networks to finally be mature. But we will continue to form new neural, neural networks in our prefrontal cortex, if we use it, throughout our lives. What's interesting with this is that um, it's uh, just like all skills, like learning to play tennis or learning to play a musical instrument, it's not something that suddenly comes online and then you have it. It's something that you develop. And certainly between the ages of 14 and 21, 23, that is the stage where this prefrontal cortex, this executive functions is developing. And to be able to develop it, you have to use it. So the more you are able as a teenager to engage on topics in SAGE or Jedi mode, the more you think about things, the more you reflect on things, the more you discuss these things, the more complex those neural networks are actually forming. And you can actually have people who get to the age of 23 who's never thought about anything, um, partly due to our education system, and you can actually have very um, undeveloped neural networks, makes one worried about Vladimir Putin, um, and you can have people who are not very much looking at the world from that perspective and are not using that area. So they've got that area as a potential, but it's not automatic that we're 23 and we start using our prefrontal cortex to its full potential. So when we talk about keeping children safe, I talked about those intrinsic and extrinsic controls earlier. Um, we're going to start looking a little bit about how we keep this chimp safe. So remember I said the way, the reason why the chimp activates and the reason why the dragon might, um, might suddenly see danger is when our adrenaline gets triggered and when we're feeling unsafe on one of those three different levels. So to be able to actually um, negotiate this dragon and be able for this dragon to develop well, we need to create some safety. Now there's different ways in how we create safety. So traditionally, and we've done this for thousands of years, we have chimp methodologies of how we try and keep our kids safe, especially now we're talking about sex. So the first thing is, is rules and regulations. They've been with us from decade, you know, for, well, since the beginning of man. Um, and that has been the primary way in how we've tried to create safety, especially around sex. And whenever we work in the system of punishments and rewards, and whenever we have taboos or cultural, thou shalt do this and thou shalt do not do that, those all very much works on survival brain mechanisms. So these are extrinsic tools we use to try and keep people safe. And I am not at, I'm not throwing these out, just to note. Um, and we will look now just at where the advantages are of using these chimp mechanisms. But it's good to realize that they are something that is created primarily through fear. So we are frightened that our kids might fall pregnant. We are frightened that they might have a baby a few hundred years ago. The easiest way was just to say um, taboo to have sex before marriage, for example. So we've created lots of cultural norms and rules to try and keep people safe. And this is an extrinsic way of doing it. There are some advantages to this, which is why we have road rules, for example. And the biggest thing is crowd control. So if you're going to have lots of people who are quite often going into chimp mode, then you're going to put very clear rules down and you're going to have some punishments and rewards. So if you're going more than 120 kilometers an hour on the highway and we catch you, then you shall pay a fine. So there is ways of um, looking after society is by creating these specific rules and, and regulations that we have. Chimp rules are very effective, especially in physical threat scenarios or like road rule scenarios um, and in emergencies. So if there's suddenly a fire in the hotel, at that stage, you want to create chimp rules and chimp um, exit plans and chimp ways of dealing with, with physical threat because it's quick, it's fast, it's efficient, it's simple, it's clear. And they're easy. It's easy to put together some very clear rule books, it's easy to write lots of guidelines, it's relatively easy to implement. So they are sort of our go-to way on how we try and manage things. So disadvantages of this is that unfortunately, human beings are not puppies. So this is very effective when we're controlling um, training our pet dog with rewards and punishments, but there's some unwanted secondary effects through implementing chimp control. So the classic one, of course, is that remember we said that we have a need to be safe physically, emotionally, and also our freedom of expression. So now if we say to people, no, you're not allowed to do that, we go, well, 
rules don't really apply to me, they apply to other people. Um, and if you want to see quite a lot of that, you can go and drive on the N2 and you'll become aware of the fact that there's quite a lot of road rules that does not seem to be applying to, <laughs> to, certain, to certain drivers. Um, but another secondary effect, there's quite a lot of them, but we won't go through all of them, is uh, the interesting phenomenon. This is also a chimp phenomenon, a complex chimp phenomenon, that if you ban something or if you make something taboo, it becomes more valuable. So if something is scarce, it becomes more precious. So, for example, in America at the moment, they are on a book banning um, in some, some libraries and in some schools. And so they were able to do a study where they compared the opinions of children who'd read certain books, which was banned in their library, and then children in another town where the books weren't banned, having read the same books. And children who read books that are banned um, are much more likely to believe what the books say and put a much higher value on what the books say. They've also shown that, for example, if you don't like the boyfriend, it makes him much more attractive. Ooh, bit of a problem. So there's this challenge that sometimes by putting a taboo on something or banning something or sanctioning something or disapproving of something is that we make it more precious, more valuable, and therefore more wanted. Um, and this has been one of the big issues we've had um, around, for example, behavior. Just smoking is a very good example, but it also around, around sexual behavior. The other challenge with chimp, with chimp rules is that chimp rules are quite good at managing large physical threat scenarios, but we now want our kids to be able to manage quite complex relationship scenarios. So you can make rules around condoms, but it's can't associate of course when your relationship. Um, and your chimp rules, regulations, punishment rewards does not work very well in, in, in helping to manage those kinds of scenarios. And probably the biggest worry with chimp rules is, of course, depending on who sets up the rules and the kind of punishments there are for the rules, they can become quite harmful. And that we have seen um, in the country, and that's still happening in some countries where there's quite severe and extreme rules and punishments to try and implement um, some of these fear-driven, thou shalt not do this. Um, and there are still countries with death sentences for, for what we would consider fairly minor transgressions. So it's just important to realize that these fear-based avoidance strategies do not create sexually intelligent adults. Now, I'm not saying we should throw these out. What I want to do tonight is I want to expand and look a little bit about what, what does the alternative look like? And some of this you're already doing intuitively, but it's becoming a little bit conscious of when are we now using jump rules to create safety? And when am I now actually trying to create sage? How do I use the sage to create safety. So how, if we were to take a prefrontal cortex view, how would one do this? So now, of course, the focus is not so much about extrinsic control, but helping the individual to, val to develop these intrinsic control and motivations and self-regulation to make their own wise and best decisions. And in the world of sexual health, you want the child themselves to decide, I want to have contraception. Um, I'm going to wait at the moment. I don't feel I'm ready right now. This is when I want to fall pregnant and being able to have, have, have um, efficacy in that. The sage will look very much at body positivity and affirmation. So rather making things taboo and making things wrong is being able to bring acceptance and love to, to differences in diversity. And then a lot of the words that come out and we are using a lot of these ideas are coming in the world currently of how we create sexual health programs is around words like consent, safety, privacy. These are all balcony view concepts that we are bringing to sex. Um, and this is all love directed. This is directed from loving and caring for those that we are trying to help. So of course, the advantages of this is that it's much more flexible and responsive to individual scenarios. So it prepares the child to manage whatever they might come across by having access to their higher prefrontal cortex thinking. But also, if we help our children be able to engage prefrontally with the world rather than just through chimp, oh, I shouldn't do that because that's wrong. Um, they are happier. They're having better mental health. There's less depression. There's less anxiety. And we definitely see better sexual health outcomes. So there's an amazing project called the Pleasure Project. You can look that up if you run any sex education program. They're looking at how we change the language around sexual health to not be fear-based, but actually be based around fostering pleasure and safety and pleasure. Um, and that's much better in terms of outcomes than those outcomes we talked about earlier than just fear-based strategies. 
There are some disadvantages. You actually need a bit of skill to be able to foster this, which is what we're doing tonight. So we need more skilled parents and teachers to, to do these kinds of things. It's less effective in your large crowds, physical threat kind of scenario. Good old fashioned rules on the road is still the way to go. And it's actually quite an early evolutionary skill, this. So prefrontal cortex is not the way the world goes automatically yet. You can look at any parliament or even the UN discussions or a lot of what we're doing in the world is still very much based on that chimp way of functioning. And we're still developing this as a skill. So to develop sexual and emotional intelligence, um, you actually need adults that are emotionally intelligent. And this is the process we are in. And I think one of the exciting things is to watching and seeing our new generation of children who are thinking and discussing and debating and bringing some of these higher thinking skills to these issues and hoping that they'll be a bit more emotionally intelligent than our, our generation. So when I talk about sage parenting or parenting from a sage way, it doesn't mean that um, there's a specific style that's sage parenting. Any parenting that happens in balcony view is sage parenting. If you are able to find that prefrontal cortex part of yourself to not come from a fear perspective, to watch out for that anxiety that's overwhelming you and you can look at the bigger picture, you will be able to bring what is necessary to your child. So people always wonder about authoritative pairing, parenting versus permissive parenting. It doesn't matter. If you're a very authoritative parent that's got lots of rules and boundaries and you have got lots of very clear cultural or religious ideas of how things are and you have a balcony way in which you implement it, excellent. If, however, you're an authoritative parent and you're bringing unreasonable rules and regulations and are unreasonable in your punishments or use violence even to implement those, that's going to be problematic. And the same with the permissive parents. If you're a permissive parent, who is open and supportive and caring and loving, but not so worried about the rules, um, and you bring a balcony perspective to that, excellent. If you're a permissive parent who doesn't even know where your kids are and is not aware of what's going on in their lives and you're not listening and engaging and you're actually avoiding, that's going to be problematic. So it doesn't matter what kind of households or religions or cultures we have. It matters from which level we implement those. So the idea is that when we create safety for our child at home, um, we're trying to reduce the reactivity of that stress axis. We don't need the dragon to practice. There's more than a thing now for things world. The, the dragon is pretty competent. It's very good at getting frightened and it's very good at trying to defend itself. That's not the problem. The problem is, is that if that chimp is um, um, running all the time, so if you've got a child who grows up in a very high stressed environment as a child, where they're constantly not feeling safe, they are constantly living on high in anxiety. It means they never engage their prefrontal cortex and they never lay down those higher neural networks. Being able to learn to control the sage needs you need to feel safe. Oh, the dragon means you need to feel safe enough for that Jedi to be able to practice controlling the dragon. And that we can create for our children at home, those opportunities. And after the break, we're gonna we're gonna do one of the a great tool that can help us do that in terms of sex. Um, and so if we can help develop our children to develop a healthy prefrontal cortex and have lots of practice to actually engage their higher thinking, that's going to be naturally protective when they step into the world of sex. So to be able to create the home as a safe space in terms of sex, we want three levels of safety, remember? We want bodily safety. We want our children to feel safe from violence. We do not want our children to feel frightened of us. Um, we do not want to use pain, although good spanking might feel quite satisfying in the moment. I'm having control. My chimp is implementing something. It might even have short-term um, helpful effects on that behavior. The challenge is all you're doing is you're activating the child's stress axis. You're not actually activating the child's higher thinking about what is going on. We want our children to feel loved and supported. We want to bring warmth and interest and availability to our children. And especially around availability, I think one of the biggest dangers at the moment is partly sometimes not having parents that are not at home, but actually just our devices are reducing our availability for our children. So um, having a scenario at home where we're actually engaging with each other and available for each other, rather everybody sitting on a device can also reduce the amount of safety our children feel at home. 
And then very more important is being to be able to affirm our children for who they are, for their dreams, for their choices, for what they think, for what they believe, for all of these ideas that they come up with. Um, and if they feel safe on those levels, then we can start having their, they can have the ability to, to create prefrontal cortex neural networks. So we're now gonna take a five minute break. Um, please write down your questions and concerns and all of that. At the end of the workshop, we're going to have time for discussion and that won't be 